Hey there, guys. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the studio. You are tuned directly into the Hidden Entrepreneur Show. I am your host, Josh Carey. Question for you. Do you consider yourself creative? Now, before you answer, you might see yourself and your own creativity in a very different light once we are through here. My guest today is going to point out how many of us are running our businesses with half a brain. She's going to help us tap into our lesser used right brain for improved effectiveness, better results, and increased communication skills. I am more than a little intrigued. Her very cool business is called The Right Brain Entrepreneur, and its mission is to help create a permanent shift in how you approach your business, educating you on the importance of tapping into the right brain. Well, let's get right to it. Welcome, my guest. It's Stephanie Steidel. How are you, Stephanie? Hi, I'm doing great. How are you? I am, I am so well. So I, I said that your, your very cool business, the right brain entrepreneur, because I know it's, it's all about bringing out our innate creativity. And on paper, you are a licensed art therapist. Tell us first and foremost, what exactly is that? Yeah, so it's based, it's actually fairly new in the psychology world, but it, um, an art therapist is a therapist that uh, instead of using the usual modality of verbal therapy is actually using the creative process where the client is uh, doing uh, certain forms of art uh, to help them navigate and um, discover some of the deeper truths or wounds that they need to heal and then using the creative medium to heal those things uh, you actually if you google about art therapy it's getting a lot of recognition with veterans right now because oftentimes with uh, traumas they can be too difficult to talk about and a lot of our emotions are stored in our right brain, which is our creative visual um, process. And so when we can use that process, we can actually overcome and heal traumas a lot faster um, without essentially re-traumatizing ourselves through um, verbal uh, modalities, which is, is sometimes the case. Hmm. And, and let's... Let's set the tone right off the bat. What is our left brain and right brain? Yeah, so we discovered that our brain is uh, divided into two hemispheres a long time ago, but uh, Roger Sperry was known for, he actually won a Nobel Prize for his split brain studies, where he discovered that the left and the right brain have different processes. Uh, they're always in communication with each other, but the left brain is our verbal center, so it only takes in information through language, uh, numbers, it's very detail-oriented, and it's, uh, it uses a very analytical uh, process. Uh, so it'll hone in on the details, which is great. Um, but it's also limiting, which I'll, I'll share later on. And then the right brain doesn't take in information through numbers or language at all. Uh, it's through picture, symbols, colors, and it's also our more emotive um, and big picture uh, part of our brain. So it, it can see multiple solutions to a problem. It thinks laterally versus uh, linearly. And also, I believe it's where our intuitive and most uh, creative ideas are housed. So um, th those are the main differences. And as I mentioned, they're always communicating, but I believe, and a lot of the science shows that most of us are trained to automatically by default use a left brain process um, more than our right brain. And I wanna, I, I wanna dig into that because I, I was gonna ask, as adults today, are we typically m more one-sided as, as individuals? Um, you know, that's a really great question. And I don't, wouldn't say that we're one-sided. 
Um, you know, we're always using both sides, but what really determines our success in life is how we are in the face of challenges. And I think that we're one-sided in how we interact with challenges um, because we've, most of us from very early age have been trained to interact with obstacles in a very similar way. Uh, and that's where we're neglecting a whole other process of our brain because it's something that's just not been nurtured um, in our schools and in our society. Yeah, um, I, I, I want to talk about how our school system, like you said, doesn't nurture that right brain creative side. And let's go back to children. I'm a um, somewhat of a new father. I have a five-year-old daughter and a three-year-old son. Love every minute of it. Learning so much from these two hooligans that I just adore in every <laughs> regard. And what I, what I see is that my children, I don't know if it's that they have no filter. I mean, for their age, they're certainly appropriate, but they seem to be the most creative beings, the most expressive beings. They just have basically no fear. Is that, is that how we all are out of the gate? Yes. Yes. A hundred percent. And in fact, there was a longitudinal study that was done. Um, if, uh, one, if you haven't seen it yet, especially as a parent watching Sir Ken Robinson's um, TED Talk, which you could do on YouTube and it's called uh, shifting or changing, sorry, changing education paradigms. He talks about this, about how uh, there was a study that shown, showed that children were tested to have a, uh, you know, a creative genius, a capacity for a creative genius, 98% of kindergartners, um, meaning that they were, you know, given a test on thinking of all the different ways they could um, use something, and they were at genius levels. And then they noticed that as these kids got older, that capacity decreased. And I am in a complete agreement with Sir Ken Robinson that a large part of that is our education system, which doesn't foster creativity, which starts to, to teach our children that there's only one answer, that collaboration is cheating, um, that, you know, that you have to approach things with a very formulaic mindset of there's, you know, A plus B equals C. And um, so, you know, I know that we're all born with that innate capacity for creative genius, and that it's essentially trained out of us. And the good news is that it doesn't go away. It's just a muscle that we haven't been taking to the gym. We still have that capacity. We've just forgotten how to use it. Um, and so being a dad is an amazing opportunity to be reconnected to that capacity because if just in watching your children, it's a complete it's joy to see how naturally creative they are. And, and you, you hit on something really big too, how fearless they are because fearlessness is an essential characteristic needed to be creative. You have to be willing to take some risk. You have to be willing to push through your fears and, and kids are a great example of that. And it's so funny you say that because the more I'm thinking about this and I say this about my kids and I hear everybody say this about their kids and everybody else's, oh, look at her. She's so smart, which yeah. th there you go. That's sort of like the key that I, I, I'm just impressed that children at the kindergarten level, the vast majority are are, are creative geniuses and have that potential. And you said that we sort of teach it out of them. What is the deal with how our education system was created in the first place? Yeah, so it, it was started in the Industrial Revolution uh, and it served a really good purpose at that point. Um, it meant that you were going to school to learn a specific skill so that you could get a job and in the Industrial Revolution those required certain subjects, and this won't be any surprise, math, science, languages. <laughs> and as a result, you can see that our education system hasn't really changed much since. Uh, those are still the core curriculum. The extracurriculars are the arts, the music, the art, the you know, physical education. Those are seen as extra and not core. Um, and 
essentially we're then looking at our development from a holistic standpoint. We're only nurturing a part, like one part of our brain. And remember, our left brain is our center for language and numbers. And so we learn in our education system how to use our left brain a lot more, but not so much our right brain, especially because now when there's uh, the education funds are cut, the first thing to go are the extracurriculars. Um, and, and there's less time that are attributed to that. And then don't even get me started on standardized tests. You know, there's no subject on music and art in standardized testing. It's all, you know, math and um, languages and science. Yeah, is this, I mean, if the, the data is there that in, in a business, in a corporation, if somebody is creative, they're gonna be innovative, certainly that can and will contribute to the bottom line. So is the reason we, we don't nurture and foster creativity in our educational system as we do the other, is it just a time constraint? There's just not enough hours in the day and something had to go? Uh, I don't believe so. I believe it's a, a larger challenge where on a societal level, we value uh, the math and sciences more than the uh, creative subjects. I mean, just the whole idea of a starving artist. <laughs> uh, you know, that artists are generally paid less. Teachers, which is something that requires a lot of creativity, paid less. And the highest paying jobs, even to this day, and I've, I've, I've been following it for the last five, six years, the highest paying jobs are in math, economics, uh, and, and, and sciences, which is great, but not all of us are naturally gifted in those subjects. And, uh, so on a societal level, we place a value through essentially through dollars on certain subjects and certain jobs. So of course it makes sense that, you know, when you're a child and say your natural gift is actually in music, you might have parents who, who, with all good intentions, are going to ask you to focus on math and science and do well in those, in those subjects so that you could be, you know, more stable or secure in your adult life by being able to have a job in that subject. Uh, but essentially, we, we are not really raising children uh, based off of what their natural talents and, and especially natural creativity um, gifts, what those gifts are. It's more based off of what we think uh, is the best choice for them to survive in our society. Mm, I'd love to start to learn how you became this intriguing and beneficial to the entrepreneur. Let's go back to the beginning. Help mm. us understand Stephanie as, as a child. Who were you? What was that home life like? Yeah, um, I, well, I'll be completely honest. So my, it wasn't awful, but I, I was a child of divorced parents and my parents got divorced when I was really young. I was probably about two or three. And it was because, mostly because my biological father is uh, an alcoholic and my mother made the very difficult choice of leaving him. And uh, I'm very grateful in, in many ways because I have an amazing stepdad. Um, she remarried a couple years later and he really raised me. And believe it or not, he's a musician and a music teacher. Uh, so I, I believe that that contributed to allowing me to, to fulfill on my own creative genius as, as a child. But I was always back and forth between the East Coast and the West Coast. And it wasn't until I got to be a little bit older, become a teenager, that I realized um, something was off. You know, I was more aware of, of how my father's alcoholism was impacting me uh, and, and his relationships. And uh, I even actually at one point cut him out of my life uh, for a very long time. And uh, that, I mean, that maybe is a whole other podcast, but it, it, that resentment and that anger that I held towards him negatively impacted a lot of my relationships, uh, both friends and dating. And it wasn't until I healed that for myself and, and forgave him and forgave him, not in the sense of condoning, because oftentimes I think we, we mistake forgiveness for saying that behavior was okay. For me, forgiveness was giving up the right to resent him. 
uh, and to have compassion because generally someone who is dealing with alcoholism and, and is abusive, which my father very much was um, towards my mother, is, is in a lot of pain and has some demons. And so I, I had to forgive him because I was actually holding on, impacting my business, my friendships, and definitely my daily life. I was always choosing, you know, men that were not a good fit for me. Um, so, so how does, you know, back to your original question of being a child, um, there were a few things that that impacted in a positive way. Uh, I'm, I consider myself very intuitive and I had to be intuitive because I always had to know, okay, is dad coming home drunk tonight or not? Like what's going on? And I've always been very good at picking up those small nuance, nuances and, and it's probably what makes me a, a very effective coach because I can pick up on those things with my clients. Um, also having, you know, being, having my mom remarry and my mom's a teacher and my father being a musician, I was always, I felt that my natural gifts were really cultivated and appreciated. And I learned piano when I was four and I continue to play piano. And so having access to a life that maybe I wouldn't have had access to if my mom had stayed married to my father, I'm really, really appreciative of. Uh, and I also was lucky enough to go to a, a private school. And as we know, private schools, because they're privately funded, they do nurture the creative uh, classes a lot more. And so it was a part of my daily life. And I was always told that I was kind of naturally creative and things came a lot easier to me. So I would find as I became an adult, my friends would come to me whenever they had a chance, really good at naturally problem solving or coming up with really new solutions that they maybe hadn't seen to help them with a particular challenge. And what I noticed as an adult was that this wasn't common, that a lot of the times people weren't, didn't have the same kind of advantage I had to have their inner creativity cultivated. And I think that really inspired me to teach others as a coach and especially entrepreneurs on how to tap into that uh, because it, it, it's not something that we all naturally learn and doesn't come naturally to everyone. And a lot of people aren't you know, growing up in great circumstances where they're able to uh, freely choose and, and cultivate their, their own unique gifts and talents. I think it's so important, the point you made about your journey on healing and forgiveness. And to reiterate the point you made, it's not condoning. It's not forgiving to condone the behavior. It's 100% forgiving for your benefit to release as you put it, the anger and resentment. Can you spell out in detail what that process of healing contained and how you were able to forgive? What led to all of that? How did that come about? Yeah. So interesting thing, I was in therapy for a long time. Uh, and I think therapy has its place for sure. But for me, I was able to discover that, oh, there's a connection here between what's going on uh, in my life and my challenges and my relationship with my father. But therapy was not able to get it complete for me. What was able to get it complete for me is I did a three-day workshop called the Landmark Forum. Uh, and that gave me a whole new perspective on Essentially, what I saw was the missing piece, which was the forgiveness. And believe it or not, in, at least with my therapist, and I actually had seen a couple different ones, no one ever told me or even pointed me towards the direction of forgiving my father. It was all about, let's take a look at this, let's process it. And I think that was helpful. But no one ever showed me that letting go was an important component. And in this three-day workshop, I got a couple of things. I got, uh, first of all, that, again, letting go of it didn't mean I was condoning it, and that, uh, and that I needed to be responsible for, for my role, meaning that he did what he did, and there were impacts for sure. But I was the one that was holding on to resentment. I was the one that was using that relationship as an excuse to – push men away in romantic relationships. Um, I was using that on a subconscious level as a way to invite 
uh, you know, emotionally unavailable men in my life, um, you know, kind of basically redoing the story of not feeling loved and wanted. Um, I was using that as a way to not trust people, to not be vulnerable with people because, you know, in my mind that, you know, you can't trust people. If I couldn't trust my father, how could I trust anyone? So I wasn't being responsible for the story that I made up about his alcoholism, which was he didn't get sober uh, because he didn't love me enough. That's the story I made up. It wasn't necessarily the truth, but I was using that story to not take responsibility for my choices in life because it was a lot easier for me to say, oh, well, my father's an alcoholic and that's just the reason why I'm the way I am. And that's why I can't trust people. And that's why blah, 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 on and on. So that was the defining moment. And, and believe it or not, in a three-day workshop, I really got that um, it wasn't complete. And until it was complete, I was going to continue to play the same record. So I wrote him a letter and I forgave him and I took responsibility for how I was using that story to not, uh, you know, make certain choices in my life. And, and he wrote me back and he actually apologized and, and took his own responsibility for uh, his alcoholism and, and for his choices. Uh, now, I'll be honest, he's still not sober. But and I and I have a relationship with him, although limited. Uh, and I am very intentional about that relationship with him because I do it mostly for him as a daughter, because I know that this man is in a lot of pain, and that the best thing I can do is to show him love in any way I possibly can um, for the rest of his life, which he's having a lot of health problems, and it, I, I suspect. He's not going to live as long as, as those that aren't, haven't been drinking every day for their entire life. So I think to answer your question, that, that was a major turning point for me, was taking that responsibility and taking, taking on my personal development in a whole new way. How old were you at that point? I was 28. 28. Now, I love the whole concept of responsibility and taking responsibility. Uh, not less than a couple days ago, I made a video on those two important points that you just happened to bring up. And it's a recurring theme I mentioned I'm seeing in, in so many of these interviews I do that it comes down to those two things. And this is literally what I did the video on, forgiveness and responsibility. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. No surprise it's coming up right now. I'd love to hear your, um, uh, a little bit more detail on what does that mean for someone to take responsibility for that? Oh, it's, well, here's what people think it means. And then here's what it really means. So I want to make that distinction. And I think what, why I resisted taking responsibility for so long that I, when you take responsibility, it means only you and you alone are accountable for your results in your life. It's a lot easier to blame other people, to blame external circumstances. And it's not to say that those things don't have a role, but who we are in the face of those circumstances is really what's going to determine your success in life, in business, etc. <clears throat> so I think a lot of times when people think of responsibility, they think they're taking on the blame um, and that they're going to take on guilt and shame and that, and that again, condoning, condoning some sort of behavior. Uh, for me, and, and this is my truth, and I've seen it multiple times, that I truly believe responsibility, especially in the context that we're talking about, responsibility is taking your power back. So it's saying, no, I'm the one. I'm going to take, you know, put my hands back on the wheel, and I get to choose every day who I'm going to be, no matter what my circumstances are, no matter what is going on in the world. And there's not always great things happening in the world. I know that not everyone um, is able to take responsibility in the context that we're talking about because there's a lot of inequality and a lack of justice. So I want to, you know, share that, that I, I get that as a white person in this living in this world, it's easier for me to say this. However, I, I do believe that 
you can empower yourself by taking responsibility for your life and saying, I get to choose who I'm going to be, how I'm going to feel, what beliefs I'm going to have. And, and yes, I might have a limited spectrum of actions that I can take, but I still have actions that I can take and I get to be responsible for those. Uh, and responsibility is scary. You know, it's, it's not the easy choice because then you have to be accountable and it can be messy and you have to say, I'm sorry. And you have to clean things up and, and, uh, and it's, you have to be an integrity in your life. You have to start doing what you said you were going to do. And, um, so it's not the easier path, but it is, it, it's been shown to me many times that it is the most successful and empowering path. You mentioned as you were telling us the uh, story of your early journey there that you weren't able to be vulnerable with people. Why is vulnerability important, especially as an entrepreneur? Well, yeah, I had a lot of difficulty being vulnerable because the story I was telling myself was that vulnerability was weakness, that vulnerability uh, was risky and scary. And that if you shared your heart or shared your story or your realness with others, that they would then have an opportunity to hurt you. Um, and you know, that was based off the belief that you can't trust people. So I was, you know, I hardly talked about, I mean, gosh, if you had told me that 10 years ago, I'd be sharing my story with you on a podcast, I would have told you you were nuts. So, uh, what I've learned is that the more I was vulnerable, the more I was real and shared my authentic story, the more people actually trusted me the more people were able to relate to me, the more people open up to me because it's rare. Most of us walk around with a huge, you know, protection system that we've built all these walls. And when we think we're interacting with each other, we're not, we're interacting with each other's walls. <laughs> we, it takes something before we actually get to know each other authentically. And so when we do encounter someone that's out there and like, here, here I am, here's, here's the worst and the best of it. It gives people permission to do the same. And in business, we want to do business with people we can trust. We want to do business with people that are real because it's, it's not as common. Um, there are going to always be people out there that just want your money or um, aren't in business for, you know, really, you know, for reasons that I find to be an integrity, which for me are to be of service. So it's true that sometimes you're going to encounter people that don't have those great intentions. Um, but if you want to be successful in your life and as an entrepreneur, you want to call in people and build trust the best way to do that is to just be yourself and be vulnerable and real because then you're relatable. And as I mentioned to you before we got on this podcast, people can't relate to perfect. Um, it's, it's, um, it, I mean, who wants to be, I mean, have you thought of someone that, you know, is always trying to be perfect? It's kind of annoying. <laughs> you're like, Oh, just make a mistake, be real. Uh, and so I think being vulner vulnerable is probably one of the best assets that you can have in your business because um, it opens up that trust, that line of trust with others. Yeah, I think the most difficult portion is the, of that is feeling, well, if I do, I'm leaving myself open to being judged. Mm. Yeah, here's the bad news. It doesn't matter if you're gonna be vulnerable or not, people are gonna judge you anyway. Um, there you because go. we're all judgmental, story-making, meaning-making human beings. And that's the irony of it is we're all trying to not be judged, but we're going to be judged no matter what. So you might as well be judged for who you really are instead of putting all this time and energy, oh my gosh, the time and energy into being something that you're not. It's exhausting. Um, and it doesn't mean... I want to say this, like, it doesn't mean, oh, I don't have to improve on myself. I, I'm not saying, oh, you get to just be a jerk. No, <laughs> you still have to always be in pursuit of excellence and, and, and trying to be the best human being you can be. But it doesn't matter. You're going to be judged no matter what. So you might as well be real.
you hit the nail on the head for exactly what I'm doing here and now through the Hidden Entrepreneur brand. I spent decades hiding behind fear, putting on a mask, showing up in every single situation as the person I thought I should be to make the other comfortable and or happy. And like you said, the big E word, it became exhausting. And then finally, finally, slowly but surely, something clicked and I said, oh my gosh, I'm just drained. I'm an adult. I have some kids here that are looking to me for the next move. I can't do this anymore. And mm -hmm. I went on and um, here we are. Yeah. And I see it with my clients all the time and also have evidence from my own personal life that when you start to be yourself and start to take action that's aligned with your highest values, who you are, your deeper purpose, the universe or call it whatever you want, um, responds in like and people show up differently. And yes, some people may fall away. The people that are no longer going to support, um, they're just no longer going to be aligned rather that. And, and that can be part of the harder process is that when we start to be ourselves, we might lose some relationships. Um, but I find that to be a positive thing because it makes room for things that are aligned for, for partnerships, for clients. And I've found that the more I'm myself, the more abundance finds me. And here we think it's what I refer to as a scarcity mindset versus abundant mindset. The, the right brain thinking is the abundant mindset that there's more than enough out there, that the more I'm myself, the more I'll attract abundance, um, that, you know, we tend to operate from that left brain scarcity mindset that I have to be a certain way. And if I don't say yes to everything, I'm going to lose opportunity. And I have found that the more you're just yourself and authentically, um, not only authentically yourself, but taking aligned action that's true to yourself, the more abundance finds you. And that's the magic of it. Take us back to college age. What did you, what did you major in? What did you want to be when you uh, graduated there? Okay. So when I first went to college, I actually ap applied pre-med. I thought I wanted to be a doctor. Um, something that a lot of people don't know about me is I was a volunteer emergency medical technician um, in high school and through, throughout college, actually. I really, I did love science in some ways and I thought I'd be a doctor. So of course I went that route and I took chemistry uh, and biology my first semester and didn't, I actually didn't do well in chemistry. <laughs> but I also had this realization of like, I don't love this enough to work hard at it. And it was my first aha of like, I, if I'm going to do this college thing, it might as well be around something that I'm really going to enjoy. Cause I am going to have to put a lot of time and effort into it. So that's when I changed my major to psychology and I majored in psychology, double minored in studio art and music. Um, and, and that, that was close, right? It was, because I love science, I love how the mind works, but I also have that creative part of myself. And the thing was though, after college, I went the very status quo route of, okay, well, I've got my college degree, let me go and get um, a job. So I got a job in something that I thought would combine my love of psychology and, and creativity, which was advertising and marketing. And for me, it was not what I thought it was going to be. I ended up finding myself behind a, you know, cubicle and uh, punching numbers and Excel sheets. And it, after a few years, I realized this is not this is not how I want to spend my life. Uh, I also knew, for me personally, I wanted to make more of an impact, and that I didn't feel I was making the kind of impact I wanted uh, through 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 marketing and advertising in, in the corporate world. So that's when I went back to school and I uh, went back to school for art therapy, which was the, seemed to be the perfect combination of everything I loved. And, and I was an art therapist doing social work for several years after that. But again, I was being called into a larger path of leadership. I felt that the impact I can make as a therapist was still really limited. And, and 
that was, I don't know, maybe for you, you had the same thing, but there were a few different points in my life where I had those pivotal aha moments where there was that fork in the road and I was like, okay, it's time to go somewhere else. And, and that's when I got the aha of like, I need to be my own boss and I need to, you know, create a business that make, uh, in a, in a whole different way. Uh, cause I knew I, I wanted to have a freedom, but I also didn't want to on my ability to make an impact and income, frankly, as well. So that's when I saw what was missing. Like all of my, my experiences, um, college and corporate led to my understanding of noticing that, wow, you know, creativity is something that's really missing for people. It's missing in our business. It's missing in our society and our education system. And that's when the right brain entrepreneur is born. Um, I believe that I, I can harness creativity in entrepreneurs and harness creativity in companies that it'll have a trickle down effect. And I know, <laughs> I know that's uh, the trickle down economics, right, is, is not always a, a great term. But I believe that if adults can understand why creativity is so important, then maybe we will be more of a stand for having more creativity with our children. Because the teachers, they're losing the fight. They keep talking about it, but our education system isn't changing. So that's my hope as well, to, as a side effect, to change the education system. If we look today at some of the most successful business people that we admire, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, what have you, how, if, how are we going to see them in terms of right brain, left brain? Are they the quintessential? Uh, yes and no. So this is where I'm going to take a very bold stand. Um, I'm not quite sure how much of an impact those people are making. Um, so I think they've been successful in regards of the context that we see success. They've made a lot of money. They have really big brands. Uh, but I question, I question the, the impact. Um, like, you know, one thing we don't talk about, for example, with electronics is where we get those materials and that there's still a lot of um, war and aggression and, and violence um, in third world countries where we get those, those um, what's the word I'm looking for, the minerals that we need for electronics. Those are things we don't talk about. So um, I would say that on one sense, yes, they've been successful because they've been using right brain thinking uh, in terms of being fearless. I mean, Steve Jobs is a great example of that. He failed many times and he got back on his feet. And a lot of times people think, oh, entrepreneurship, it's like a one shot deal. You know, I'm going to be successful right out the gate. No, pretty much every successful person failed and failed hard. So you, you have to be resourceful and resilient. And that's part of right brain thinking is being able to push through your fear and being able to get back up. So I think men are a good example of that. I am a stand that we take it another step further in really getting clear on a bigger why, on how our business is going to make a, a deeper, wider impact, and standing for that as well. Because that takes even more courage and even more resourcefulness to solve some of the world's biggest problems. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's my firm belief on those, on those men. It answers it perfectly. What is one thing that you help your clients do, change, implement to get on this road of right brain thinking? What's that first thing? Uh, oh, gosh. I have to narrow it down to one, okay. Um, well, a large part of my work is is helping people with their mindset. The other thing that we tend to think as human beings is that the more I do, the more I'm going to have. So it's, yes, marketing is important. Yes, you know, discovering your niche and having a good strategy. Those are all important things, but that's not what stops people from having the results that they want, whether in business or in life. It's generally they're in their own way. It's their mindset. It's the limiting beliefs that they have. It's uh, the things that aren't healed. 
Uh, it's the fear of being vulnerable, the fear of putting themselves out there, imposter syndrome, like who am I? You know, so many, so many things that will stop people from taking action. So sometimes they think, oh, I just need a business plan. You can have the perfect business plan, but most people won't do anything with it because they're not addressing the mindset piece. So 90% of my work is helping people over, over those challenges, those blocks, those, and discovering what those inner blocks are. Because once you remove those, everything else is easier. So mindset includes, you know, discovering and pushing through fears, uh, learning how to be resourceful, how to, and by resourceful meaning using your, your community, um, tapping into your inner talents, um, creating like that abundant mindset. And, um, and, and, and that's, that's basically the essential, uh, what's, um, the word's okay. not coming to me, the essential building block of creativity is resourcefulness. So I would say those are the, those are the parts of mindset that I work on. Looking back on your younger self, what advice would you give to her? Hmm. I think the biggest advice that I would give to her would be to not spend so much time worrying about the right choice, making the right choice, that uh, everything is meant to support me in my journey and that even the stuff that's really painful has its place in my evolvement in evolution rather as a human being um and so we tend to resist the negative aspects of life and i resisted that a lot in my younger in my <laughs> in my younger life and even sometimes still today but i would tell myself to not resist that to allow it to learn from it and to know that it's temporary and that it's going to be a part of the process that will ultimately get me to where I want to be, that it is part of it. What mantra do you live by today? Um, the biggest one that keeps coming up for me is that the only way to fail is to quit. Um, and there's been many times where I've wanted to quit as an entrepreneur and, and, and times where I've lost like hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes in investments that didn't go the way I wanted them to. And it's very easy to take your toys and say, I want to go home. Um, but the only way you truly fail is to quit. And that's the mantra that keeps me going. I absolutely love that. Very, very profound. Really, really love that. Are you, are you spiritual or religious in any ways today? I, I would say I'm more spiritual and I personally have had a struggle with God uh, for a long time <laughs> and part in my adult life. Um, you know, I'm in my late thirties now, I would say, especially in my thirties, that's when I've been, discovering what works for me because I had a lot of negative associations with religion in particular. And that was a big mistake because to associate religion with God or universe or source, um, it's a way of containing something that we can't possibly understand. And religion is built by human beings and human beings are fallible. So it's very easy to look at religion and the not great things that some religions have done and say, oh, well, if that's God, I don't want to be a part of it. And so I had to heal my relationship with God. And, um, and I've been given a lot of evidence lately that there is something beyond my comprehension that supports me. And that the more I surrender and the more that I trust and the more I stop trying to control every little thing, the more that source provides for me. So I have become more spiritual in the last decade in the sense that I pray uh, every day, I meditate every day, and I use it a lot more in my coaching um, in terms of 
helping people to exercise that same skill of surrendering, letting go and trusting, trusting that what's meant to happen for your greatest good will, will happen. And that can be, that can be a tough pill to swallow sometimes. Did I hear you correctly? Did you say that you were given evidence? Yes. Can you expand? Sure. Um, oh gosh, I, now I'm on the spot to come up with something because now I've had so much evidence that I, I don't even know what to pull from. Um, I've done, I've done a lot of medicine ceremonies recently as well. A lot of what? Uh, which is medicine ceremonies, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, shamanic journeys, if you will, that have helped me tap into a more spiritual part of myself. And, and what I noticed was that when I started, I couldn't even say the word God for a long time. Um, and when I started using the word God, which for me means just universe and source, it, it's not, you know, maybe a God you'd find in a Bible. Um, but when I started using that word, when I started to pray, things got a lot easier. Um, abundance came to me a lot easier. Um, so that was one, one part of, of evidence. Um, and just when, when I just gave it up a little bit to God saying, okay, I'm going to do what I know to do. It doesn't mean I'm just going to sit on a mountain and meditate and a million dollars are going to rain down on me. I still have to do the work, but that I'm going to trust that God has my back. Ever since I've done that, I have not had to worry about my finances. Something shows up. Um, I also give back a lot. I try to, you know, I, every month I give to a different charity and like clockwork, every time I give money to a charity or I give of my time as charity, it comes back to me tenfold. And so there's something about that, that practice that is now working for me. I, I just can't ignore that that's evidence that something that there's a, a divine relationship now that I've created. Brilliant. What do you believe happens when it's all over, when our time here on earth comes to an end? I don't know. And I have been, it's so great that you asked that question because that is something I have been dealing with on a personal level. There's a part of me that's afraid of death because there's a fear that everything I've done in this lifetime will be for naught. And I'll just die and rot. And it's, I think my biggest fear is that it's meaningless. Um, on the other side, we have, when, you, know, you can read lots of books of near-death experiences. There's a book, um, Many Lives, Many Masters, that very intriguing about how there's been some evidence pointing to that you know, reincarnation and that we choose our lives and that um, we choose our role um, in the evolution of humanity. Um, so I wish I knew the answer. And if anyone knows the answer, I would love to know. <laughs> but I think the biggest thing that I've learned is it's maybe just not ours to know, like the future is not ours to see. And that can be hard. So all we can deal with is the present. Um, because so far, we have not been able to measure what happens after death. I will leave you with this final question. Stephanie Steidel, how would you like to be remembered? Mm. I think that, well, I think I want to be remembered by the feeling that I leave people with. I mean, impact, uh, you know, would it be great to build a business that's going to impact uh, other individuals and companies that will have a butterfly effect and, and really create some solid change in the world. Absolutely. That would be a great way to be remembered. Uh, and that's what I'm working towards. But I think, you know, if I were to go tomorrow, I would want to be remembered by the way I left people feeling, uh, that I left people feeling inspired, motivated, capable, uh, really, in touch with their full potential. That's, that's what I want, um, is to leave people feeling that they are capable of greatness and magic. Hmm. Yeah. 
Well, I can tell you this, for this one lone soul, you can check that box because you have <laughs> absolutely left me feeling all of that and more. If anybody listening wants, like me, wants to remain close to you by your side, how can they best get in touch? Um, oh, there's a couple of ways. So you can check me out on my uh, website, the, the rightbrainacademy.com. There's a lot of great resources there, some free trainings if you want to learn more about tapping into your right brain. Um, and also, you know, I always like to offer free gifts for, uh, you know, whenever I'm on a podcast. So if people want to have access to um, uh, one of my books, you can get it for free and also an opportunity to have a, a complimentary call with me. And you can access that at the rightbrainacademy.com forward slash free gift. So that is um, my, my, my way of saying thank you for this amazing opportunity uh, to be, to just share my message and have really awesome, deep conversations. And then also just another opportunity for people to take this work another step further. Well, I started this, uh, introduction by saying uh, you're the founder of this very cool business and that has just been blown out of the water. You yourself are a very cool woman. I thank you, Stephanie, for opening up your candor and for sharing your story with us today. It means a lot. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for, for this. It was not what I expected. I had no idea what I was going to come in for, but I love these kind of conversations because I think they're important. I think they're very important for people to hear. I completely agree. And everybody tuning in, if you completely agree, let's keep the conversation going. And uh, another episode is not too far behind. For now, go do your best work. Have a blast out there and go get them. <laughs>